Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the KDD keynote speech section. My name is Jin Feng Pan from Facebook. I'm working on large scale machine learning systems and products. As Facebook's mission is to give people the power to share and to make the world more open and connected, we are more than happy to support uh, great speakers like Daphne Kohler, who make the education world more open and easy to share and communicate with, like say, in the format of Max Online Open Courses. Daphne Kohler is the president and co-founder of Coursera, a social entrepreneurship company that works with the best universities to connect anyone around the world with the best education for free. Coursera is the leading platform of its kind and has partnered with over 100 un top universities world round, offering hundreds of courses in a broad range of disciplines to millions of students spanning every country in the world. Kohler was recognized as one of the Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2012, Newsweek's Top 10 Most Important People in 2010, Huffington Post's 100 Game Changes for 2010, and more and more. Prior to founding Coursera, Kohler was the Rajiv Bhatwani Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University, where she served on the faculty for 18 years. In her research life, she worked in the area of machine learning and probability modeling with applications to system biologies and personalized medicines. She's the recipient of many awards, which include the Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers, the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the ACM Infosys Award, and a membership in the United States National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Science. She's also an award-winning teacher who pioneered in her Stanford class many of the ideas that underline the Coursera user experience. She received her Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and her PhD from Stanford University in 1994. Today, Kola will give us a talk on Maxi Online Open Courses, what we have learned. She will show us how Maxi Online Open Courses provide opportunities for open-ended projects, intercultural learner interactions, and collaborative learnings. She will also discuss and show the data and analysis that collected from Maxi Online Open Courses and show a lot of examples and impact that can be derived from providing millions of people with free access to the world's best education, of course, for free. Okay, now I think I'm going to uh, hand over my time to Dr. Nicola. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here after what I understand was a very fun and exciting evening last night. Um, so it's been a number of years since I gave a talk at KDD, and my last one was on was very different from this one. It was about my research work in machine learning and data mining, and so this one, as you'll see, is a bit different um, in its context, in its content and tone. Um, I'm going to start by sharing with you a little bit of the history of how we got to where we are on MOOCs and then delve into some of the data analytics that we have obtained from the MOOC platform over the last three years. So Coursera really began in early 2012 as a byproduct or as an end product of the experiments that we ran at Stanford University in the fall of 2011, where we took three courses, uh, graduate courses in computer science, databases and machine learning, which really speak directly to this community, and artificial intelligence, and put them up for everyone around the world to take for free. 
uh, without any publicity or any attempt at PR other than a single New York Times article that went viral, um, each of those courses ended up having an enrollment of 100,000 people or more. So that was a real moment in time for us and we realized that we couldn't just put this on hold and go back and write some more machine learning papers. So we decided in late 2011, early 2012 to spin this out of Stanford and create a new entity called Coursera which would work with multiple top universities to take some of the amazing education that had been available only to a tiny handful of privileged people and make it available to anyone. So uh, we launched in April 2012, which is just a little bit over three years ago. Many people don't believe that. They think we've been around for at least a decade, but that's not true. Um, and in April 2012, we had four university partners, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan, 37 courses, and 200,000 learners that were left over from the Stanford courses in the fall. Fast forward three years, this is a relatively recent screenshot, and as you can see, we now have um, over a thousand courses from 122 top universities offering um, education to over 14 million learners worldwide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, each of these numbers, um, but before that I'm going to add just a couple of other cool stats. Uh, in the three years that have elapsed, we've had over two million course completions. Um, and we've had over 13 and a half thousand years of video that have been watched uh, by learners on the platform. So uh, I mentioned 122 partners. This is um, a partial map of the partners that uh, we're privileged enough to work with. I'm sure many of you here can recognize your current or former institutions on this diagram. You can see that in the United States, we have many of the top private and public institutions, in addition to the ones I mentioned, Yale, Columbia, University of Washington, University of Virginia, and many, many others. But I'm glad to say that we now have partners not just in the United States, but in 25 countries on five different continents. And you can see some of the, uh, some of the top universities in China, in Singapore, in Australia, in Switzerland, France, Germany, uh, the UK, and so on and so forth. So, um, and as a consequence, we're able to offer education, as you will see, in not just English, but in 10 different languages. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, this talk has two major parts. The first is about understanding what we can learn from our courses. And the second is understanding what we can learn from, about our learners. So I'm going to start with talking about our courses. Um, so there's been a lot of noise in the media about the so-called lack of completion in the MOOCs. And indeed, if you look at the stats on completion rates, you will find that it is true that of the people who click the enroll button on the website, only about 5% end up completing the course. And people say, oh my God, think about what would happen if our universities had a similar completion rate. That would be awful. So before I go into the details of completion rates and how one could actually evaluate quality of, uh, of MOOCs, let me just sort of put this uh, number in perspective. Of the people who sign up for a MOOC, only about half even show up on the first day. They were browsing on the web, it was late at night, they said, ooh, this sounds cool, they click, and they don't even show up to watch the first lecture. Of the ones that do show up on the first day, about half leave after watching the very first video, because in many cases, they had a complete misunderstanding about what the topic of the course is even about. I've had people tell me that they signed up for astrobiology because they thought it was actually astrology, and were really disappointed. So they didn't stick through the rest of the course, what can I say? Um, which is fine. So that's already cutting this down by, by to 25%. Now of the ones who stick around, we have a number of different sort of what you non-completion modes that I don't think really count as a failure in the course. You have people who watch the watch three or four modules and feel like they learned something of value and go away feeling satisfied because they got what they wanted. This is analogous to picking up um, a, a nonfiction book by, uh, by Kahneman and saying, oh, I read three chapters, I feel like I learned something, that's cool. 
Then there's people who stick through the entire course, watch every single video, are active in the discussions, but don't submit a single assignment. That too counts as lack of completion. But what it really corresponds to is lack, uh, is a diversity of motivations among different learners in terms of what they're trying to get from the course. And I'll come back to the learner motivation a little bit later. So I think the main message that one should think about this is that course success in the MOOCs is a much more multidimensional at, um, attribute than what you would think of in terms of success of a traditional college course. Um, and you can see there is, a huge there is a huge distribution in terms of completion rates, and often the same instructor can actually have two different courses that have very different completion rates because they correspond to very different learner profiles. So here, for example, you have Calculus One which has a much lower completion rate than Calculus two by the same instructor, the difference is that people who are in Calculus two know what they're looking for, and that's why more of them complete. So if you think about the multi-dimensions of success, I'm going to give you sort of just a few examples that span the spectrum. Here's two courses, one from Northwestern University on teaching the violin and viola, and one on the University, by University of Michigan, Introduction to Finance. Both of these, surprisingly, despite the fact they're very different from each other, have very high credential rate. People actually want to get the credential for this course, but they have very low lecture retention because they are actually hard. Um, on the other side, you have two other courses on the fiction of relationship and equine nutrition, again, very different from each other, have a very low credential rate because the credential doesn't have a ton of market value, but have a very high lecture retention rate and very high NPS score. So there are multi-dimensions to success, and so one of the things that we did is we uh, wrote down a whole bunch of different things that you might think about as different success metrics, and we did a correlation plot. So for instance, over here on the left, you can see the, uh, the, you can see the correlation between um, NPS and improvement in understanding, and at the bottom you see a different correlation plot, and you can see that some of the success metrics are extremely highly correlated with each other, and others are extremely uncorrelated with each other, which basically says that there are multiple dimensions that you might consider in terms of the success of courses. And we based, by looking at that correlation matrix, we boil it down to six that are sort of uh, typical or characterize that matrix that I just showed you. So first of all is content demand as measured by the total number of active learners in a course. Lecture retention the people who stick through in terms of lecture watching from the first lecture to the 50th percentile, to the, about halfway through the course. Course completion, the proportion of active learners who actually complete the course, including all of the assessments, which is different from lecture retention, because remember I told you that there's people who complete the lectures and don't do a single assignment. Um, learner satisfaction, which is measured by an NPS score question that, uh, that I will show in a, in a little bit. Um, credential value, the, people who com the proportion of people who elect to obtain a certificate, and platform retention, uh, which is the proportion of active learners who like the experience enough to still be on the platform three months later. So these are, all, these are six largely orthogonal dimensions of course success and are very weakly, if at all, correlated with each other. So in terms of understanding these notions of course success and which aspects of, course, of the course contribute to each of these. We looked at a whole range of data that we can measure about these courses. So what do we know about these courses? First of all, we know a lot about the course metadata, the subject area, the course description as, as specified by the instructor, the location of the university, is it in the US, is it in China, and the learner demographics of the people in the course. Lecture video attributes. There's things that we can compute automatically, like how quickly are the people, is the instructor speaking in the video? And we can do that because we have the subtitles that we put in for accessibility purposes and also for non-English speakers, so we can calculate the average number of words per minute um, that the video has. We can uh, measure video quality, where the video was shot, is it indoors, outdoors, and so on. The reading level of the video, remember we have the transcript so we can calculate reading level, how animated the, the presenter is and so on. There's learner provided feedback that we get via a mechanism called quick questions, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then there's various things that involve the course design and structure, like um, the length of the le lecture video, what kinds of assessments it has, the length of the course, and so on. So that's a lot of information. And remember that at this point, we have run 
over a thousand courses, uh, many of them more than once. So we have about 2,000 data points from which we can start estimating various uh, correlations between these different factors. So let me now show a few statistics about the courses in general. We have over 300 non-English courses, so we can also start calculating things about uh, English versus non-English. Um, we have 60% of courses that involve what I would call a very substantial assignment. And those substantial assignments are the ones that are not multiple choice or short answer. These are the ones that have either a programming assignment or a peer graded assessment, which is often an open ended design project or an essay or something like that. Um, the average course description length is about 34 words and the average duration of a course is seven weeks. Now, drilling down again into the data statistics, if you look at lecture videos, uh, the median word per minute is about 157 words per minute. The median reading grade of the narrative in the courses is about seventh grade. Um, the average video length is 10 minutes and the average length of video between IVQs in video quizzes, which are these quizzes that stop in the middle of the, uh, of the lecture, is 26 minutes. But that's a very broad distribution as you'll see in a moment. So as I said, there are certain things about video that you can assess automatically, like the average number of words per minute. But uh, there's a lot more that we wanted to know about videos to try and correlate it with success metrics. So we did a, a crowdsourced annotation effort that had people look at every single one of our courses and annotate the videos for attributes such as how engaging did you find the instructor, how would you rate the production quality, how would you rate the sound quality, how animated is the instructor and so on, how well do they explain the concept. So there's a number of um, annotations and we did 35,000 annotations that were crowdsourced um, for the courses in our data set. Um, continuing on to the list of the different types of, um, of data set, we also have this notion called quick questions. These are things that pop up as the learner is going through the course and you ask a single quick question and uh, you record the answer, and that gives us yet another more learner perspective data point about the course. So some interesting quick question data. Uh, there's 340,000 respondents to the quick question so far for expanding 629 of our courses. Average NPS scores 4.1 out of 5, and 37% of them were very likely to take a course from the same instructor. So now I'm going to go into some of the findings that we have. I think one of the biggest ones is that the single most determining factor about all of these attributes is the content area that the course has. So let's talk a little bit about how you measure content area. First of all, um, there is a, you've seen in the examples, a very broad range of topics on the platform that span raising chickens, Russian tax law, Galois theory in French, um, Beethoven piano sonatas and many more. So that means we need a categorization system that really helps us predict learner behavior as a function of those course categories. And unfortunately, maybe due to a poor design on our part in the early days when we had a much smaller course catalog, the list of categories that are on the site that the instructor stipulates are actually not super predictive. Um, they're too coarse grain, they don't really align well with uh, with a lot of things. So in order to come up with a better set of categories, we, came, we turned to machine learning. We used um, the co-taking matrix, co-occurrence if you will, of people who take the same courses and found that the material broke, very, that the courses broke very, very nicely into tight clusters based on the co-taking pattern that different people had. So if we then apply spectral clustering to, um, to this data, you end up with very tight, cohesive units that you can now start to manually name. So for instance, that little blue cluster in the middle is society and governance. This, of course, is a human assigned name. Um, art and literature are the orange dots. Computer science is that big cluster at the bottom left. Statistics and data science right next to it, and so on and so forth. So you end up with a very, um, a very nice clustering along with some very nice um, uh, relationships between the clusters. So you, as I said, you find statistics and data science next to computer science, and you find biology next to public health and healthcare. Um, and sure enough, if you find courses that are, sorry, you find clusters that are close to each other, if you look at something that sits in the middle, 
you find courses that really are multidisciplinary. So that course here between law and environmental science is Introduction to Environmental Law and Policy. So these categories are much better than the ones that we had as human specified on the site. And you can measure that by looking and seeing that the outcomes that we have are really um, across different outcomes. First of all, they differ very much across different categories. So for instance, you can see that computer science courses have high enrollments, high lecture retention, pretty high, um, moderately high credential value, and very poor retention because they're hard. Um, statistics and data science, on the other hand, have a lower enrollment, but have a very, very high credential value in today's market. Um, and on the other hand, if you move to the right, uh, teaching has really low enrollments. There are not a lot of teachers on our site, but has a, actually a pretty decent credential value. So interesting patterns emerge when you start correlating those categories with the performance metrics that we're interested in. And the categories that we came up with automatically via clustering are considerably more predictive of outcomes than the original category. So what you see on the left is the web categories um, and the R squared between category and outcome. And on the right in green is the clustered categories that were automatically derived. And you see that uniformly across the board, the clustered categories are more predictive of the outcomes that we care about than the original web categories. And so it says that course categorization is really important. And what we're doing right now is actually coming up with an even better categorization that exploits both the clustering as well as some human insight. And we're using those to, as the categories going forward. So now let's look at some of the outcomes that we care about and try and understand what drives that particular um, outcome. So let's start, start by thinking about enrollment, which is the number of people who come into the course and are active in it at the start. Um, so as we know, um, the, probably the single biggest driver of enrollment is the content area. Interestingly, you see that the biggest enrollment category is actually humanities and philosophy. Those are categories that people come and enroll in. It doesn't mean they complete. It certainly doesn't mean that they credential, but they really like that category. Right below that is computer science, then medicine and nutrition, and then it goes down, and you can see there is a very striking distinction between the different categories. What else drives enrollment? Well, turns out that shorter titles correlate with higher enrollment. <laughs> the shorter the title, the more people are likely to enroll in it. Consistent with that, simpler descriptions also correlate with higher enrollment. So for instance, here you have one that's on the left. We understand the world and ourselves through stories, and the, some of those hopes and fears become the world. High enrollment. This course will discuss various aspects of the Remnibi internationalization, lower enrollment. So strong statistically significant correlation. Uh, there's a lot of other cute findings, but I want to move on to some of the other uh, categories. So credential value and satisfaction, which are correlated. There's some interesting findings here. So demand for credentials, as you might expect, differs strongly between categories as well. Business strategy, very high. Teaching, surprisingly, very high. Um, environmental science, computational biology. At the bottom, math and logic. Credential value, not very high. Not a lot you can do with that credential. Um, interestingly, for those of you from non-English speaking universities, the demand for credentials is not limited to English courses. It turns out that Chinese courses have a similar distribution of credential values as do English language courses, once you uh, co correct for areas. What else drives credential value? Um, it turns out that the thing that is, once you correct for content area, what people really want is to master difficult material. So credential value is higher in classes that are perceived as more difficult. Okay. Um, they also want, to, however, to understand the difficult material. So correcting for category and difficulty, higher understanding correlates with higher credential value. So if you take a really hard class and you don't get it, that doesn't have a high credential value. Now let's think about learner satisfaction. The strongest correlation with satisfaction is your self-rated improvement in understanding. And you can see that is a very strong pattern. 
the more you feel like you understood the material, sorry, the more you feel like your delta in understanding was high, the higher your satisfaction. Now, know what that means. This is the delta in understanding. This is the improvement in understanding. If you came in and you already understood the material and you didn't know what you were, and you didn't learn something new, you're not as satisfied. So the main outcome of this, mess of this section is that learners want to learn. We see a positive correlation in promoter score with difficulty um, and a positive correlation for understanding with promoter score. So the more difficult the course is, the happier you are. The more you understand it, the happier you are. Coming back to retention and completion as the next metric of course success that we care about. Again, retention highly correlates with course category. Teaching is very high up there. Animals, the chicken course has very high retention. So does equine nutrition. Music and sound has very high retention, but then it comes to the bottom and math and logic, and that has a much lower retention rate. More frequent interaction correlate with better retention and completion. So this measures the number of in-video quizzes per minute of course. And what you see is that the higher the number of in-video, the higher the frequency of in-video quizzes, the better the retention rate. People tend to like those. Speaking faster is associated with better retention and completion. This is words per minute as, uh, versus uh, the retention rates, log odds of retention rates. And you see that the faster you speak, the higher the retention rate. This runs counter to what you might expect in a traditional college classroom. We have to keep people following along. Here, because of their ability to pause, rewind, or potentially play more slowly, people actually prefer for you to make better use of their time. Finally, if we look at the notion of interestingness, which is obtained from our video annotations um, and is the principal component of all of the annotations that relate to how interesting the instructor is, the more interesting the instructor is, the more likely they are to retain their students, which is probably not surprising. So how should you be interesting? These are the things that in our annotations are part of that first principal component. Animated, passionate, speak naturally, look at the camera, and have good production values. And this, by the way, is our single highest rated video in terms of interestingness. It's a calculus course. It would not be what you would necessarily expect. Now, here is um, an interesting question. There was a recent publication by a group from edX looking at some of the edX data saying that when you looked at a small set of videos, um, there was a significant effect of video length on, um, on retention. So this is their findings, and you can see that the x-axis is videos grouped by length, and the y-axis is how likely people were to stick through watching them. And that's the pattern they found in that subset of courses. So we looked at our much larger subset of courses, and we tried to see if we could replicate that finding. And the answer is, at least in our data set, the answer is maybe, but not as much. The pattern is not as striking as you saw in that, um, in that graph. So what you see here is the average video length of uh, videos in a particular course compared to their residual retention. And you can see that as the video length gets longer, the retention rate does dip a little bit, but it doesn't dip a lot. So perhaps you, I mean, if you try and make this consistent with the edX data, this says that in a single video, if it gets very long, you might stop, but it doesn't affect in a very significant way your overall chances of sticking with the course. So in two different perspectives on the question of video length. Finally, the other thing that you might care about, of course, is what about learning outcomes? So we talk about retention, we talk about credential value, but ultimately we want to know if people are learning something. Um, this is not a question that has been explored a lot even in traditional college courses. We don't do a pretest and a post-test for people coming into a, a standard course to see whether they are now understanding something better than they did before. But we tried to now, in the context of this platform, to explore this question, and we took a few courses where we had a sufficiently large question bank um, that we could, in fact, do a pretest and a post-test. And what you see here are the distributions. Um, this is an, an econ class of uh, between the first attempt uh, and uh, the last attempt on the, um, on the 
on the quiz in the pretest. So we let people submit more than one. And so you see in the pretest, there is a distribution that's very much skewed to the left. And that distribution is considerably different in the post test. That is, the number of questions that learners got right in the post test is considerably not larger than the number of questions they got right in the pretest. So the answer is that people do learn something. And by the way, the same pattern persists when you look at the same learner beginning to end. There is a clear, uh, there is a clear learning value um, to these courses. So now we're trying to do this in more courses that have sufficiently large question banks that you could actually run this experiment. So summarizing this section, courses can be good in very different ways that are largely orthogonal to each other. Content area matters across the board for every single one of them, but in different ways. Learners want to master challenging materials. So if you want to come up with a really good course, that's what you should be aiming for. And the last one is be engaging. So the second part of the talk is understanding our learners. We talked about understanding our courses. Now we're going to understand our learners. I'm going to start with a geographic breakdown. So first of all, our growth internationally outside the US has been very, very rapid. This is a growth graph uh, for different countries. The US is at the top, so I took it out so it wouldn't squish everything else. But you can see that um, China is at the top after the US with, I think, 1.2 million learners. India broke a million quite recently. Uh, we have Brazil that overtook the UK. Um, a, few, a few months ago. This is somewhat surprising since at that point, and even at that point, there were no Portuguese language courses and English language penetration in Brazil is less than 10%. Uh, we now have a few Portuguese language content uh, courses, but I think this, the, la the, the fact that the top three graphs are all emerging countries, all, em all emerging economies, all of them have English as a second language at best. Um, and it really demonstrates that there is a huge need for this kind of quality, quality education in, um, different con in, in that kind of economy. Um, so if you look at today's, at the sort of a bigger picture beyond the growth rate, we see that only about 30% of our learners are in North America. 9% are in Latin America, and with that I actually include Mexico, which officially is in North America. 27% um, are in Europe. 27% uh, are in Asia, 4% are in Africa, which is pretty uh, remarkable given the lack of internet penetration, 2% here in Oceania. Um, this is, um, uh, and right now, this is a sort of a broad distribution, but we have learners in every single country around the world. So bar, bar none. I used to have to say, except for North Korea, but it turns out that some enterprising learners from North Korea managed to tunnel out, so good for them. Um, it turns out that we talked about interest in different content areas. It is striking just how much variability there is in geography in terms of the interest in different areas. So what you see here is a chart for China, India, and Mexico, and the interest in different categories. And you see that in India, computer science wins over pretty much everything else, but people care a lot less about music and sound. In Mexico, people care a lot about um, uh, music and sound. So you really see that there is a huge diversity in what people care about across different geographies. Um, in the other is a huge interest in engineering courses, often at the introductory level. I'll come back to that in a little bit when I talk about learner demographics, why we see such an interest in engineering courses among Indian learners. The other interesting thing is that learners tend to prefer local institutions. So that might have been unexpected. It was unexpected to me. It's like, well, we have you know, Stanford and Yale and all those amazing institutions. But it turns out that there is a very strong local brand recognition, local loyalty effect that has a very strong diagonal, as you can see, of the preference to local institutions by learners in that country. So that's another interesting finding. And it turns out that this is not purely a language issue. So even if we look at English language courses only, the diagonal is still there. So it's not that Chinese learners prefer Chinese university courses because they're taught in Chinese. Even for English language courses, you see the diagonal. So that's a little bit about um, learner ge geography and how that correlates with um, some of the metrics we talk about, talked about. Now let's look at demographics and motivation. So first, some overall statistics. Uh, gender breakdown is about 60% male, 40% female 
Again, that is very strongly different across geographies. In the United States, it's close to 50-50. In India, it's considerably more skewed male. Um, age distribution, if you look at this, we have the quadrant on the top right, which is 18 to 24, and then the by far largest fraction of our learners are in the 25 to 34 year old range. These are not current college students. We'll come back to this in a moment. These are people who are now in the workforce and are using this for continuing education purposes. And then you can see that the rest of the distribution is um, even older ages. So relatively a small fraction of people who are really um, college age, as you might define it. Um, a few other global learner demographics. Uh, if you look at employment, about 55% of uh, the people are employed full time. Uh, another 9% are employed part time. Another close to 10% are self-employed. And then the other, the other people are currently unemployed, of which I would say probably the, self, the partially employed and the unemployed and looking for work are people who are looking to potentially better their lives by access to this platform. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Finally, in terms of educational attainment, you can see that the large majority of our learners are actually educated in uh, by in, in, in having a college degree. 35% of them have a bachelor's degree, another 41% have even post-graduate uh, education of some kind or another, master's, PhD, MD, MBA. Um, so you can look at it as well, 75% of your learners already have a college education, or you can look at it the other way and say 25% of them, of our 14 million learners, don't. So it depends on how you like to look at it. So. That's sort of a, an overall breakdown of the statistics, of the demographics, but I think it's what we've done also is a learner motivation segmentation. So we sent out a survey to a bunch of learners and asked them a bunch of demographic information about them, what their motivations are, why they were interested in taking um, courses and so on and so forth. And when you did a clustering analysis on those data, you discovered that there's three different groups among our learners consistently across geographies. The first are the ones that you, um, what you might call college focused. These are people that you can see the age distribution are, I, the, the biggest peak are 15 to 20 year old and then, it, then the largest one after that is 20 to 24. These are people who are either currently in college or are looking to go to college. And they're using this to either better prepare themselves for college education, um, to be more, uh, better uh, equipped to apply, better equipped to take the courses, figure out what major is good for them, or they are current college students that are looking to um, supplement what they consider to be an inadequate education that they're getting from their current institution. Um, they're not happy with the quality of instruction and they're looking to do better. In the US, that group is about 15%. In countries like India, it's considerably higher. Um, on the bottom left, you have the second category, which is enrichment learners. These are people with a much broader age distribution. You can see that it goes all the way from 15 to 90. Um, there's two peaks around 25 and around 55. And these are largely people who are learning for the joy of learning. They're taking, they're, they're interested in a whole eclectic mix of subjects. I'll come back to that in a minute. And they're not doing it for any extrinsic purpose, but only for intrinsic happiness. And finally, our biggest category by far consistently across geographies are career skill builders. These are people who's, who, that make up the bulk of that big lump that you saw at the 25 to 35 year old range. Um, and they're looking to these courses as a way of upskilling or reskilling in their career. So the content interest, as you might expect across these learner segments is very, very different. The enrichment learners love arts and humanities courses. They love social science courses. They also like natural science. They don't like computer science, engineering, um, natural science, okay? The, um, the prospective or current students are the ones that take courses in by far predominantly math and logic to better prepare for STEM education. They also take courses in natural sciences and in computer science, but they don't take courses in arts and humanities, in personal development, in social sciences. And the career-oriented learners, they take business, computer science, and data analysis. 
So since these career-oriented learners are 50% of our audience, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we serve them well. So as I said, 52% of our learners cite career improvements as their key motivation for taking courses on Coursera. Why is that? Why is that such a large number? So a few global trends that contribute to that. First of all, demand for higher level education in the context of uh, career is increasing rapidly. So if you look on the chart on the right, in 1973, only 16% of, of jobs needed a bachelor's degree or higher. In 2020, that number is 35%, so more than twice that number. Um, that trend is only likely to continue, and indeed 65% of the 55 million new job openings between 2010 and 2020 will require more than a high school degree. So people need a higher level of education in order to have a chance at a reasonable career. But the initial education is not enough. So a second global trend is that learning is becoming lifelong. It used to be that you graduated from college, you went to work for General Electric or IBM, and you stayed there for the rest of your life. That's no longer the case. Millennials will have over 13 jobs in their lifetime, and the typical time they stay in any single job is about three years. Furthermore, when they move from one job to the other, the new job that they have typically requires not only skills they don't have, but skills that didn't even exist when they went to school. Think about data science, which is our single most popular uh, course platform-wide by far. Data science as a profession didn't exist 15 years ago. Another one that's very popular right now is digital marketing. When you went to school 15 years ago to learn marketing, it was all about placing ads in newspapers. And now it's all about Facebook and Twitter, which didn't exist 15 years ago. So clearly the skills that you need are new ones. Another global trend which reflects our international user base is that there is a considerably limited capacity in emerging markets. So between 2002 and 2009, China and India accounted for half of global higher education growth, 26 million of 55 million. And the reason for that is twofold. In many of these emerging countries, you have a population bulge of younger people that is starting to hit higher education institutions, are starting to hit college age. That's one reason. Um, and the second reason is that as they move from a agrarian economy into a more um, information economy, they don't have enough qualified employees to fill these information jobs. And indeed, 14% of India's college age population is in college, whereas what they want this number to be in order to fill the jobs is more like 30%. Now, the problem is that in order to increase the post-secondary completion rate from 14 to 30%, one would have to build 1,500 new academic institutions, which sounds daunting in itself, and, but is even more daunting when you consider that even in the current best Indian institutions today, there is a huge shortage of qualified instructors to teach. So where are you going to find additional instructors to teach those, in those 1,500 institutions? So that's another reason why there is huge needs for education, especially in these markets. And then finally, even if you're lucky enough to get an education in, in higher education in, in an emerging market, that doesn't actually guarantee much. So in India, for example, according to a survey of employers, only 25% of engineering graduates are, employed, are employable, and only about half of college graduates are employable across the board. Now, that forces a lot of large Indian employers to set up their own universities to which people go after they finish their college education. So again, a huge demand for higher education at quality. So in order to serve those, there, what you really need to do is first of all provide the right content. We, as we said, everything's about content. So what we have are what we call specializations, which are these targeted bite-sized chunks of knowledge that are that address skills gaps that exist in today's economy. Data science, as I said, our sig single largest um, offering so far. Business foundations from Wharton, digital marketing, introduction to project management. And for those of you in this audience, I should tell you that there is a huge bulge of really exciting data science content coming up on the platform really, really soon. So there's gonna be a lot more of that. The other thing that people need is it's not enough to have the learning, you need to have credentials to, that will demonstrate that as a signal to employers. And for that, we have this notion of certificate of which at this point, more than 30% of course completers elect to earn a course certificate. 
Um, that number is considerably higher in the employment-oriented courses. This is a platform-wide average. In data science courses, that number is north of 50%. Um, and we also know that 75% of employers in a survey done by Duke University say that they will recognize MOOCs as a factor in hiring decisions. And then finally, what we also see is government endorsement of these credentials starting to emerge. And one of, these, one of the more interesting case studies along these lines is the government of Singapore, which basically said, we need more data scientists. We don't have enough. So they're paying $790 to every completer of the data science specialization. Now, that covers the value of the certificates plus another $200 reward. Now here's the calculation that the Singaporean government has. Um, they figure you finish this, you're an immediately employable data scientist of which there is a huge demand. So they're going to recoup that $790 from the taxes on your first paycheck. And sure enough, they've been able to produce over several hundred data scientists via this program so far in the first two cohorts. Um, and they're so happy with this that now they're expanding this to other employability related skills um, beyond just data science. And Malaysia, by the way, is now replicating this uh, program for data science as this first um, entry into this. So we talked about who the learners are. We talked about how we create content and uh, experiences to serve them. And so the very last bit of this is, well, okay, but is that helpful? Does this actually help you transform lives? And so I'm going to end this talk with a few both data points and stories to talk about this. So we surveyed people who said that they were career oriented and who completed a course on the platform. And we asked them, was this helpful to you? And 87% of them attribute some kind of career benefit to their experience. Now, benefit is a very broad term. It ranges from I got a job to I can do my current job better. So some of them are pretty tangible and other ones are a little bit more vague. So we focused on very tangible benefits of you either found a new job at a higher pay or you started your own business. And that number was 32%, which is still a very high number. What I think is even more interesting is that respondents in emerging economies or in the lowest third of socioeconomic status are much more likely to report these tangible career benefits than uh, learners in more developed economies. So you're helping the people who really need the help. So numbers are all great. And it sounds very nice when you talk about numbers, 87%, 32%. What I'd like to end with is reminding all of us that these numbers represent actual real people. So I'm going to end with two stories of the kinds of career transformation that one can help by making education freely available. This is Charmin from Bangladesh. Um, Charmin is a, um, was an activist who was distressed by the fact that in Bangladesh, girls are on a regular basis sold into servitude by an employer, to an employer or a husband. Um, she convinced a friend to run away with her and they opened a bakery to try and sustain themselves. But neither of them knew how to run a business so the bakery was floundering and was about to go out of business. Charmin discovered online courses and decided that she was going to learn how to run a business. She started out with a micro econ class from Penn um, and then a model thinking class from Michigan. Then she took some courses from Irvine and Michigan and, and eventually a, a marketing class from Wharton. And she learned how to run a successful business so that now her bakery is earning not $900 a month but $5,000 a month which is enough to sustain not only her and her friend, but also five other women who now have an alternative to being sold into servitude. So this was an example of the ripple effect of providing education and how it can help not just a single person, but also a little circle around them. Um, the next one is a similar example, but on the other side of the globe. This is Kehinde from Nigeria. Kehinda was one of the lucky ones in that he was an engineer in Lagos, so he had a good job. But he thought he could aspire to more than just low-level engineering tasks. So he started taking courses in technology, in entrepreneurship, in computing, and became more and more confident of his skills and took a very courageous step because good jobs in Nigeria are hard to find. And he left his job at IBM to start his own business. And the good news is that it worked out really well, not only for him, because he now has a company that employs 10 full-time people. 
But Kehinde still has a problem because finding qualified engineers in Lagos is hard because the quality of education there is not great. And so Kehinde has all of his employees on an ongoing basis take courses online so as to hone their skills and make them better. And as he says, how else could a startup fulfill learning needs with a lean budget? And um, th this helps him fulfill their mission of developing local talent. So those numbers that I gave you, the 34%, um, are people like um, Charmin and Kehinde and others elsewhere around the world. And so I'd just like to end this talk with, um, with a final quote, which is one of my favorites. It's a quote by H.G. Wells who says that history is a race between education and catastrophe. And the hope is that by making education free and available, you can help mankind win the race. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. And thank you for leading this. Thank this you. is one of the most groundbreaking revolutions in the history of humanity. Thank you. No question. Uh, we have time for questions now. We have microphones. We have one over there. Could you talk a little bit about the, the finances of Coursera? In other words, you know, how, how are the faculty compensated? Are they compensated? What are the fees to, how, how does the organization sustain itself? What, what fees are charged? Sure. Um, so the only source of revenue that we have right now are these course certificates that I mentioned. Um, this is an entirely optional thing. You can take the course without um, getting a certificate. But if you want something that you can post on your LinkedIn profile or demonstrate to an employer, then you pay a relatively modest amount of 50 to $70 um, on average for the certificate. And that it helps you in your, in your path to your career. As a side note, for those people like um, Kehinde and Charmin who might not be able to afford $50, there's also a financial aid option that they can apply for and get the certificate in addition to the content for free. Um, so that's the primary source of revenue. As you might imagine, it works great in some courses like data science where we have high credential value. It doesn't work nearly as well in art history. So not every course has a revenue stream that makes it in profitable in and of itself. Um, but some courses, specifically something like data science, brings in a relatively substantial revenue stream. And the way we do this is that any revenue that comes in gets shared back 50-50 with the university that produced the course. Now, they internally divide the revenues with the instructors in formulas that vary dramatically from institution to institution. Some of them, many of them, use similar uh, formulas as they do for other intellectual property rights like patents, in which case part goes to the institution and part goes to the instructor. Others have different kinds of compensation schemes. That is something that we generally are not party to because it's an internal policy decision within the institution. Can I? I have the mic. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you talked a lot about um, the content and how you decide to deliver rel relevant content, but learning is really a social experience. Mm. Um, are you thinking about connecting students, uh, embracing local communities uh, so that people can learn together? And I, I think that that can increase actually the engagement much more than actually having a better content. Yeah. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. Learning is a social experience. I actually think that one of the things that made this initiative successful to begin with is the fact that even in the most generic version of the course experience, there is a social component. Um, in, an, in a course where you have one instructor and 30,000 people, the instructor can't answer all the questions on the forum. And so what we have is uh, learners answering questions by other learners, and that too is a form of social engagement, and people often learn a lot from having to answer questions. Similarly, <laughs> we had the peer assessment, which is the, which is, uh, in which learners provide feedback to the work of other learners, and that too is a valuable learning experience for both sides in that equation. Um, those are relatively limited interactions, however, and uh, off the platform, we've had a fair bit of, as you said, self-organizing communities that meet in a coffee shop once a week to discuss the Coursera class that they're taking together, and we know that this has 
considerably increased retention rates for people that participate in that. We also have a partnership with a number of organizations, including the U.S. State Department, where they actually make available um, spaces in U.S. embassies all over the world for people to come together and, under the guidance of a facilitator, take a course together. And their numbers are that it's around 70% completion rate for people who are participating in one of these, uh, what they call MOOC camps. So, um, but that's currently happening off platform. The next evolution of the platform will be to put some of that social experience inside the course experience in some kinds of group work, small cohorts that are going through the course together. We're exploring different ideas on what kind of social interaction is most beneficial. Nice thing is that we now have an experimental platform. We can try out different ideas. I have a question. So, uh, you know a lot about courses, about students. We know about AI. Have you thought of building curricula that mm -hmm. optimize certain goals, even short curricula? Um, that's a really good question. Um, right now, we're uh, exploring the precursor, as you might think of, to curricula in having a much better recommendation system of you just completed this course, which is the course you should take next, or conversely, you're struggling with this course, here are some courses that you might want to consider as a precursor. Um, recommendation systems are what all of the other personalization websites currently use, from ranging from Netflix through Amazon. So curricula would be a step beyond that. Um, we'd like to do the first step before we see how much value there is to constructing things that are more sort of pre-engineered, pre if you will. Um, sorry, I have the... Um, so what do you think about a Coursera for high school? Because um, you, you show in your presentation that many people are highly educated, but the problem I think in many countries is that the, at the, is the high school level. So how do you think parents should deal with, with that too? Like, um, yeah, so I completely agree with you that in many countries the problem starts much earlier than college. In fact, I would argue that in many countries it starts even earlier than high school. You have gaps in basic reading ability. Um, we know a lot of uh, high school students are using this on their own. I also know of some high schools that have started to adopt some of the courses within their curriculum kind of as a bridge to college, and I've seen that happening in different countries. Um, that's currently a much more grounds-up effort. The college, the courses that we have are not specifically geared at the high school population. Um, they're, they're more advanced, and we have a few that are introductory, like Intro Python or Intro Calculus that people are taking kind of as bridge courses to college. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to create content that high schools would benefit from, and I think it's a good idea, and we're actually starting to you know, try and develop that introductory part of the curriculum a little bit more. Um, I have to say that as a, um, as a business model, trying to sell to high schools is exceedingly challenging. They're all each so idiosyncratic and governed by a different group of people with different motivations that it's a lot easier for us to think of this as a direct-to-consumer set of courses which allow people to basically vote with their feet on what's beneficial for them. And so that's the beauty of appealing to the adult market is that people have the autonomy to say, I am learning better via this mechanism and therefore it's rational for me to spend my time on this as opposed to having to convince an organization that has a whole bunch of other interests that are harder to, um, to understand. Hi. Um, you talked about um, loyalty, like local loyalty towards uh, institutions. How much does it have to do with the course that is provided? For example, in India, the course is maybe more engineering oriented rather than more arts and, sci uh, arts and humanities this oriented. This is correcting for category. There is a preference for local institutions that is not specific to the category. Okay. Um, and it's not specific to the language. It's, uh, it's an enrichment on the residual in the, in the prediction. Uh, when you talk about understanding learning, uh, learning outcome, uh, when is the post assessment, post assessment done? Immediately after the completion of the course or there's a time lag? 
Uh, in the one experiment that we ran, which admittedly is like a very, very, it's like a very small experiment, it was immediately at the end of the course. It's hard to get people to come back three months later to complete a learning outcome assessment. Uh, how do you go about to authenticate um, here? Here, I am. <laughs> how do you go about authenticate uh, your uh, students before yeah. granting the uh, certificate? And uh, what's your thoughts on personal provide personalized education with you know a very data driven uh, fashion? Sorry, what was the second half? I didn't hear the second half. Uh, what What's your plan? What's Coursera plan to provide more personalized education okay. based upon data? So that's two different questions. Um, the first is we have an identity verification mechanism that uses both webcam photos and keystroke verification. On the webcam photo, when you are enrolling in this, in this verified certificate program, you um, hold up your picture ID to the camera and someone compares that to your face so that we can see that you are who you say you are. Uh, that happens uh, then on an ongoing basis. We ask you to take a webcam photo and we can compare that to the original photo so we can still see that you know, you're the same person sitting at the keyboard. The other mechanism for verification is a keystroke biometrics. It turns out that if you and I type the same phrase, our typing pattern will be quite different. And it's impossible for me to teach you to type like me. So it's not as unique as a fingerprint, but it's still pretty difficult to imagine finding someone who will take the course instead of you and can also type like you. So um, that turns out, I think, to provide a pretty decent mechanism for identity verification. It is not a full solution to the academic integrity problem. That is, you can still call someone on the phone or have someone an give you the answers to the questions. Uh, that's also, unfortunately, true for the homework you submit in college. So this is not a full solution to the cheating problem. Um, in terms of personalization, that's a really good question. Uh, we haven't really played around with personalization of the learning curriculum very much so far. Uh, it's, a, it's clearly something that we'd want to explore. I will say that uh, when people talk about adaptive learning, there is what I would consider to be the vanilla adaptive learning and a more advanced adaptive learning. The vanilla version is the thing that dis actually distinguishes our courses from taking a course on campus, the ability to go at your own pace and rewind when you need to and pause when you need to, the ability to realize that you didn't do this assignment right, so you probably want to go back and rewatch the video later, um, the ability to skip backwards and skip forwards, all of these that are driven by a learner are all things that you could do right now in the courses as they are designed. The sort of uh, much more advanced version of, advan of, of adaptive learning would be for the system to somehow recommend to you that if you miss this assignment, you probably want to go back and rewatch this video. And that's, it's, you know, the benefits of that for a third grader learning to multiply decimals is clear. The benefit of that for someone taking a college level art history class is not so clear. So that's where I think there's some interesting experiment, experimentation that needs to be done on how much incremental value does this additional layer of adaptation actually provide in the college space.